Hello, my name is David Detman. I work at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Um, I'm making this video today to add my voice to testimonials on uh, human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Um, these abuses span from um, forced re relocations to detentions to forced homestays, um, arrests, um, and general attacks on Uyghur language and culture. My most recent trip to Xinjiang was last year, in March of 2018. I was in Asia already for another uh, spring break event, and I had a week to, to um, take off and visit Kashgar and Khotan. I also planned to go to Atush, but I was not allowed in to that city. Um, I, uh, I, this wasn't my first time to Xinjiang. I've been going there since the 1990s, so I have some experience in, in, um, in the region, and I know how I can see how things have changed over the past recent years. Um, my early experiences actually drove me to study Central Asian studies and Central Asian languages and literature in university. Um, so I have um, experience, um, some basic conversational Uyghur, um, and I'm comfortable with Mandarin Chinese. Um, this trip was really depressing. Um, it was really, really different from prior trips. Um, uh, most obvious to me was how restricted people felt in, a, in being able to talk to me. So um, Uyghurs are kind of notorious as being extremely hospitable, and that's true. Um, but this time, um, people went out of their way to kind of avoid me after I was identified as a foreigner. Um, and this is because they, um, they felt like they would be endangered um, by talking to me. They would be seen talking to a foreigner, and that would put them in some sort of danger. Um, uh, so Kashgar um, was, was um, a shocking surprise, um, arriving into Kashgar and noticing the substantial military presence, military and police presence. Um, I was last there in 2010, and there was already a military presence there then, um, but not like now. Um, now um, you're constantly being made aware that everything is controlled, every step is controlled. You go an underpass to cross a street, um, there's a like a, an airport security kind of situation where you have to show your identification card. Any block in the old city, um, the weaker neighborhoods, um, has that same kind of checkpoint. Um, after I was identified as a foreigner, I was quickly kind of swept through there and the guards kind of knew like, oh, just go. Um, um, but I, I, I could see that everyone else had to go through the situation. I should say those who were clearly Uyghurs would go through the situation. I did notice people bypassing that um, if they were clearly not Uyghur. So there's that. Um, um, the military presence is one thing. Um, the, um, the, every neighborhood now has militias. Um, this is back, I, I should say that this was happening in, in March of 2018. I don't know how things have changed since then. Um, but there were Uyghur militias for, for various neighborhoods um, that would have red armbands and big sticks, and they would kind of march down the street together, banging sticks on the ground. Um, I have to say that was a jarring site. Um, um, businesses need to hire security guards to run, to have an open business, like a restaurant or a bookstore or something. Um, so these are civilians that are dressed up like police. So they have like flak jackets that say police on them and hard hats. Um, they're sitting in front of the businesses. Um, other businesses that don't have those security guards, they have to keep their doors locked. So if you go to a restaurant or something that's clearly open, um, you might have to ring a doorbell or something to be let into the restaurant in order to, to sit down. Um, what this, what this feels like when you're walking down um, a street in Old City in Kashgar in March of 2018 is that there are more police than people. <laughs> it's a really, really bizarre situation. Um, um, on top of that, there are military um, expositions or parade, not parades, um, just shows of force basically that are happening throughout the day. When I arrived in Kashgar, um, it looked like something serious had just happened, but it was just a, a daily exercise where they close off the main street, the north-south um, Jiafanglu in, in Kashgar, and they'd have a military parade. Um, city buses were parked nose to tail at the top of the street, blocking traffic, um, so that they they had just blocked the street off for marching soldiers. Um, the other really surprising thing um, in, in, in changes how changes that I that I recognized is that you just don't see that many Uyghurs out anymore. And I have a feeling that, I mean, internment camps and, and forced relocations, that's part of the story, but um, it's, it's probably also just um, really annoying to go across town because it, take, there, it, just, it takes so much 
um, and energy and effort. So if you don't have business across town, probably you wouldn't want to go because it's just too frustrating. Um, uh, so um, Kashgar was quite different than I than I remembered in that respect. Um, the bustling, like uh, people out buying things and selling things, that seems that it's heavily restricted now. And people just aren't out. Um, for, from from my perspective, as someone who um, takes great joy when I travel around the world, my favorite thing to do is to talk to people in local languages, um, talk about food, talk about music, talk about language. Those are my favorite things to talk about. Um, this time, that was very difficult, almost impossible to talk to people um, because they wouldn't, they weren't willing to talk to me. Um, and these things are also kind of sensitive now, like. Uyghur culture is sensitive. <laughs> I mean, if you're not talking about the singing and dancing kind of state representation of what Uyghur culture is, then it's kind of sensitive. Like, if it has something to do with religion, no, that's that's not okay. Um, so the the crackdowns that are happening, the arrests that are happening in places like Kashgar and Khotan, um, if you follow state media, um, the state doesn't generally talk about those things at all in China. Um, but when they do, um, it's because of terrorism or religious extremism, separatism, something like that. That's what's driving these kinds of actions. But those of us who, have, who know people there, who know people who are disappeared there, uh, we know that religious moderates and political moderates are also being swept up into, this, into these camps and, and disappeared. We don't know if they're arrested or if they're in camps or what. Um, what that tells me is that the dangerous people in the authorities' eyes are the people who have respectful voices in Uyghur society. So academics, people who are professors of Uyghur literature or anthropology, they're gone. I mean, um, this, this is incredibly disheartening for people who care about Uyghur culture. So um, you can see this very clearly if you go to a bookstore. Um, bookstores, are, that, that tends to also to be one of my favorite places to go when I visit a new place. Um, Kashgar's got some great bookstores, and they still have some open bookstores as of March 2018. Um, um, but this, the stock of books um, is, is increasingly limited. So the new publications um, in Uyghur um, that have come out relating to food culture or language or any kind of cultural thing, um, uh, just from, from, my, from what I could see there, it seemed like the, there aren't any new publications. And it seems like the last publications were 2016. Um, it used to be the case back in the 90s that there was a huge interest among um, Chinese about Uyghurs. So if you went to a Chinese language bookstore or a Chinese section of a bookstore, um, there would be tons of books about Uyghur culture, about Uyghur music, about all kinds of things. And those are also gone. And that really troubles me. I mean, like, what the, what, what happened? <laughs> I mean, um, is that there, there must still be interest, but it's a sensitive topic and it's not allowed, you can't publish on it now. So... Um, that's just deeply troubling. Um, uh, like, like many people test testifying, I know people who have been disappeared and I, and we don't know where they are. Um, we can, I mean, in some cases you, you can assume that they're in a camp, they're in an internment camp. Um, um, and I guess for those who've studied China in recent history in China, this, these things might sound kind of familiar. This is um, a time that's very similar to the Cultural Revolution. So when local languages, local traditions, this kind of cultural baggage that everybody had in China um, was meant to be swept away for, to, to make the road for the new China. So the new China is going to be this new citizen that, can, that will speak Mandarin. Everybody speaks Mandarin and can kind of get rid of this old stuff, religion, blah, 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 and get rid of that. Um, it really feels like that's happening in Xinjiang right now. And I guess my, my only like hopeful thoughts are that, I mean, the Cultural Revolution was a period that passed. After that, um, there was a flowering of Uyghur culture. There was a flowering of academia all over China. There was just a, a beautiful period of publishing. Um, a lot of people interested in other things and like just diversity and all kinds of things. Um, I hope that returns quickly um, because, I mean, this is it. This is it. Like I said, if you, if you value culture, um, human culture, um, this is incredibly disheartening and it needs to be, things need to, need to open up. So thank you for listening. Um, as an American, um, I'm 
painfully aware that we have camps in this country um, that um, th that are, are are facing the same kinds of human rights abuses that are that are happening in Xinjiang, and that's that's um, embarrassing and and painful for me as well. Um, I don't mean to be saying that um, that uh, we as Americans are somehow high high and mighty and and, and not. Um, prone to these sorts of problems as well. I mean, we have serious problems with racism in this country as well. Um, but please um, take interest in, in local cultures in Xinjiang and, and thank you for listening.